Hello and welcome again to another chapter in chemistry. We are covering measurements and their uncertainty in this section of the chapter, which is all about scientific measurement. Some measurements are very large or small and are easier to understand if written in scientific notation. For example, the number of stars in a galaxy might be 200 billion. But that's a hard number for us to wrap our minds around, so in scientific notation, we could rewrite this as 2 times 10 to the 11th. Scientific notation involves writing numbers in the form of something times 10 to a power, where the A in this formula is somewhere between 1 and 10. Now it could be 1, but it can't be 10. It's got to be something less than 10 and 1 or greater. And the power on 10, indicated with an N here, indicates how far to the left or to the right to move the decimal point when converting back to normal notation. Measurements are never perfect. How good a measurement is depends on two factors accuracy and precision. Now, a lot of people use these two terms interchangeably, but actually they're not. You need to make sure that you understand the scientific definitions and uses of the words accuracy and precision. So we're going to start there with some definitions. Accuracy describes how close a measurement is to the true value of the quantity being measured. In other words, how well a measurement agrees with the accepted value. Precision is a little different. It refers to the degree of exactness with which a measurement is made and stated. It also can refer to how well several measurements agree with one another. We're going to explore these two different concepts visually using dartboards. Now we all know that a dartboard, that the goal is to hit the center of the dartboard, known as the bullseye. So we're going to look at this first dartboard at the top left and decide is it accurate, is it precise, is it neither or is it both? Using our definitions, we look at the first one and we see that all four of these darts are very close to each other. Now that's either accuracy or precision, but which one is it? If you think back to our definitions, you'll remember that precision can be defined as values that fall very close to each other. So I would say that in this case, this person is throwing darts very precisely. However, they missed the target by a mile. They were trying to get the bullseye. So they're not very accurate. As you can see, the circle kind of described by the, where the point tips lie does not include the bullseye. So it's not accurate, but it is precise. In the next target, we see that once again, four darts have been thrown and they don't lie very close to each other. So that's different than last time, so we don't have precision in this particular one. However, when we look at the circle described by the pattern in which they were thrown, we can see that the bullseye is right at the center of that pattern. So believe it or not, these are actually accurate. If we average them together, we would get the bullseye. But they're not precise, they're kind of all over the place. In this target at the top, we see that all four darts are very close to each other, once again, that's good precision, and they all happen to be right at or around the bullseye, so they're also accurate. So this is both precise and accurate. And our final picture at the bottom, we see the four darts are widely spaced, so the precision is bad. If I look at the basic shape described by their points, the bullseye does not lie anywhere close to the center of that shape. So we would say that it is neither accurate nor is it precise. Now what actually causes inaccurate or imprecise measurements? Errors in measurements can come from many sources. There's always human error because we always make mistakes. We may read something wrong. We may put a measurement instrument next to something to measure its length, not line it up correctly, use the wrong units, not understand the ruler that we're using. There's also inconsistent methods. I wouldn't want to be measuring two liquids for a lab and measure one in a graduated cylinder, which is a very precise instrument trying to get 75 milliliters, and use a 100 milliliter beaker to get about 75 milliliters for my second liquid because I was too lazy maybe to clean out the graduated cylinder that I began with. That would be using an inconsistent method for measuring liquids. Parallax error is a little different. If you've ever looked at a clock, if you look at it straight on, you know you're seeing the right time. But if you're looking at that clock, 
far to the left of the clock or far to the right, it's a little more difficult to determine what minute the minute hand is pointing at. And that's an example of parallax error. Damaged instrumentation refers to things like if you've ever used an old ruler that's been dropped many times and maybe the very edge of that ruler was marked as zero and that edge is now worn off. Well, then it's going to be a damaged instrument and you're not going to be able to see where zero begins at. So that's an example of damaged instrumentation. We can actually determine the amount of error and in order to do that we need to know two values. We need to know the experimental value, which is the one that you measured in the lab, and the accepted value, which is the correct value according to some other reliable reference. Now those can be used to figure out the amount of error as well as the percent error. We're going to figure out how to do that now. The amount of error can be determined from taking the experimental value and subtracting from it the accepted value. Using this then, we can find the percent error by taking the amount of error, which could be a positive or a negative value, so we want to take the positive of it. In other words, we want to take the absolute value of that error and then divide that by the accepted value. Now that's going to give us a decimal, and we want to change that to a percent by multiplying by 100%. Let's try an example. During an experiment, a student found the density of aluminum to be 2.25 grams per cubic centimeter. Upon looking it up, though, he found it should have been 2.70 grams per cubic centimeter. To find the experimental error, you would find the experimental value minus the accepted value, which in this case, you would take your value of 2.25 and subtract 2.70, which would be negative 0.45 grams per cubic centimeter. We found the error. Now we're ready to find the percent error. Remember that you have to take the absolute value of the error in this formula. So we would start with the absolute value of negative 0.45, giving us just 0.45 in the top of our fraction, divided by 2.70, the accepted value, and then times 100%. When you put this into your calculator, what you should get is 16.6 .6 repeating. That would round to about 17%. So our percent error is 17%. Now, this is where we get into a concept known as significant figures. This is how we know how precise of a measurement was taken. Significant figures are all of the digits of a measurement that are known with certainty, plus a final digit, which is uncertain or is an estimate. The precisions of the markings on the scale of the instrument we are using to take the measurement determines how precise our measurements can be. Now you may be asking yourself, what are they talking about? When my math teacher told me that, you know, 100 is the same thing as 100.0, I figured he or she was right. And mathematically, that's true. But in science, we frequently are doing measurements and we wish to indicate using precision, using extra digits in our answer, if we have measured to a higher degree of precision. So if I measure my desk and find it to be 30 centimeters wide and I report it as 30 centimeters, it sounds like I measured to the nearest 10 or maybe whole centimeter. But if I measured it to the nearest tenth of a centimeter and it seemed to be exactly 30 centimeters, I would want to indicate that by writing it as 30.0 centimeters. It indicates a higher degree of precision in my measurement. When measuring the length of this board in the diagram, your precision is limited by the smallest unit marked on the instrument. You estimate to the tenth of the smallest marked increment as you take your measurement. So in diagram A, we see that the board is just a little bit over half of that one meter stick. We would indicate that it's a bit over that by going a little bit more than 0.5 meters, which is 0.6. If that meter stick is marked with 10 centimeter markings, from 10, 20, 30, on up to 100 centimeters, then we can actually measure to the nearest hundredth. Notice it's just a little bit past 60 centimeters, so we would indicate that by taking it and writing it as 0.61 meters. However, if each individual centimeter is marked on that meter stick, then it becomes even more precise in our measurement by saying it's not at 60, it's not at 61, it's somewhere in between the two, and it's closer to 61 than it is to 60. So we would call this 0 0.607 perhaps, or you might say 0 0.608. Eight. But if you said something like 0 .604, I would disagree with you and say that you didn't measure correctly because it is obviously a little over halfway along between 60 and 61 centimeters. So although there can be a small difference between your measurement and your neighbors using the same measurement instrument, they should still be very close to each other. 
If you used a ruler to measure a nail, such as you see in the diagram, you might find that the length of the nail was halfway between 6.3 and 6.4 centimeters. The ones in the tenths place are both known with certainty, but the hundredths place would be an estimate and is the smallest significant figure you can find using this particular ruler. You would write down the value as 6.35 perhaps. Now, if we're given a value for someone else's measurement, such as 43,890 kilometers, and we need to use it in a calculation, we need to determine the number of significant figures. Written as it is, we would ask ourselves, was this measurement taken to the nearest kilometer or was it to the nearest 10 kilometers, which is what, how I would read that. In other words, is that zero significant? Now there are rules found on pages 66 to 67 of your textbook, but I'm going to teach you instead of a set of rules with, where you have to memorize a whole bunch of rules, I'm going to teach you something known as the Atlantic Pacific Rule, which has two parts to it and that's it, and it's much easier to remember and apply. Initially it takes a little bit of time, but once you've seen it applied multiple times, you get a feel for it and it's not too difficult. So we're going to use the Atlantic Pacific Rule. Now to use this rule you do have to remember that the Atlantic is over there on the east coast so it's over on the right and Pacific is on the west coast and so it's over on the left. So using the Atlantic Pacific Rule it's just a way of remembering which side of the number do we look at as we're beginning to figure out the number of significant digits. If a decimal is present in the number, notice the P in present, that tells us we're going to be looking at the Pacific side. So if a decimal is present, then start counting significant digits with the first non-zero digit starting on the Pacific side of the number, which means starting at the left side of the number. The second part of the rule says that if a decimal is absent, then you would start counting significant digits with the first non-zero digit starting on the Atlantic or right side of the number. Let's try applying this we're going to figure out how many significant figures each of these numbers has. So using our rule, let's start with the ones that have decimal points in them. The very first number, 200.320, that has a decimal present. So we start on the Pacific side, that's the left side. Looking from the left to the right, the first non-zero digit is a 2, and it and everything after it going from left to right is considered to be significant. So we have six significant figures in that number. Scanning through these numbers, looking for another one that has a decimal present, we get over to 0 0.00030400. Now, once again, the decimal is present. We're going to start on the Pacific side looking at this which is on the left. We're going to go from left to right and my first non-zero digit looking from left to right is that 3. And it, as we go further to the right and everything thereafter, is considered significant. So the 3, the 0, the 4, and the two zeros that follow it, all five of those digits are counted as significant digits. They wouldn't have put those zeros down there on the end if it wasn't indicating a higher degree of precision of measurement. And finally, our other decimal number is 1.003. Decimal is present. We start on the Pacific side. The first non-zero digit is the 1, and so it and everything thereafter, looking from left to right, is counted as significant. So there are four significant digits in that number. Now let's go back through our numbers and look for ones that don't have a decimal. The first one we come to is 9,000. And notice the decimal is absent, so this time we're going to start on the Atlantic side of the number which is on the right, and we're going to look from right to left, going backwards through the number. From right to left, looking for our first non-zero digit, the 9 is the first non-zero digit, and we're continuing to look from right to left, and so the 9 is the only significant figure here, so it only has one significant digit. Looking at the number 3300, we see that it has no decimal, so the decimal is absent. Start on the Atlantic side once again, and so on the Atlantic side, first non-zero digit from right to left, is that first three going from right to left. So that means both of those threes are significant, so there are two significant digits here. In 50,245, we use the Atlantic Pacific Rule and we're starting on the Atlantic side again because the decimal is absent. So starting on the Atlantic side, that's the right, looking from right to left, that 5, 4, 2, 0, 5, all of those are considered significant because the 5 on the right is the first non-zero digit looking from the Atlantic side. So all five digits are significant here. Up at the top of the next column, we have 20,170, and it has no decimal. With the decimal absent, we look from the Atlantic towards the Pacific, so right to left. And what we see 
is that the first non-zero digit is the 7. So the 7, 1, 0, and 2, those are all significant. So it has four significant figures. And that's our last example. So you should try this. You've got a worksheet that you are going to use to try this out on your own. So at this time, you need to try numbers 1 through 10 on the significant figure in class worksheet.